The most important thing for me as a GM is that I can get my massive collection of rule books into my car. So let's see. It's 2020 and this is a Tesla Model 3. Let's start the show. Before you click away from this video, there's only one thing I want you to take away from it. And that is that in 2020, an electric car is a viable choice as an everyday driver. It's practical and it's economical as well. You may spend a little more upfront on the car compared to an internal combustion engine vehicle but through the lower running costs through the lower maintenance and fuel costs over your ownership of that car you will make up the difference and end up saving money so i want you to at least consider buying an electric vehicle when it's time to replace your old fuel-guzzling monstrosity. Now you might wonder why am I watching this on a gaming channel. But I started this channel to have a channel where I could talk about stuff that I'm doing anyhow. And over the last year that ended up to be pen paper RPG most of the time. But uh, I always planned that it could be video games or cooking or anything really I'm really into. And I spent a lot of time and effort in researching what car to get next because the lease on my um, previous car, a Volkswagen Touran, uh, came to a close and uh, I really wanted to get an electric car because I knew they were more economical and because I'm concerned that in the future I might not be allowed to drive in a city center with an internal combustion engine my last car, Volkswagen Touron, had a 1.6 liter diesel. And after the Dieselgate scandal a few years back, I bought that car after the Dieselgate scandal and I thought there's no way they will do the same shit twice. But as it turned out, they had. Even the new Euro 6 diesels that are supposedly really clean, they cheat on emissions. They like uh, deactivate the the add blue system if the temperature is below 10 or above 30. Do you know how often that is in Germany? It's like half of the year. So I really didn't want to keep it because I thought the resale value would be really low. And so I was either looking for a cheap petrol engine to take me over until I could get a really nice electric car or get a really nice electric car. Tell you what, Tesla Model 3 was not my first choice. I thought it is too expensive. I compared it to uh, the Hyundai Kona E, Volkswagen ID3. That, that was basically it. My favorite was the Hyundai Kona E had been in the market for a bit, had a good range, really good price at the moment because of uh, the German government 
electric car subsidy and Hyundai offered further buying incentives over that so I could get that one on a new lease agreement and it would have been uh, like 50 euros a month cheaper than my previous car the uh, aforementioned Turan but big but I I, uh, I do fantasy lab as a hobby which is basically uh, camping with very heavy very big and heavy camping gear really heavy tents and stuff and armor and weapons and everything so I need to have a trailer hitch so I can take all my camping equipment a few times a year and drive it to the lab site. I don't actually need a, a huge car because most of the year I uh, use it as a daily driver to get around, to get to work, uh, go shopping, do the groceries, meet my friends, whatever you need a car for. And uh, a small hatchback would really do that easily enough. Something like a Polo, even an Up. Used to drive a Peugeot 106 and that would have been big enough. I went to my first laps in that. But yeah, I really wanted to have a trailer hitch. And somewhere along the production, they changed the Hyundai Kona E so it couldn't pull trailers with the trailer hitch. You could only use it to mount a bicycle rack, which I don't really need. I need to pull a trailer. Um, then I thought, okay, maybe, maybe I save so much money with the Kona. Even if I can't use my trailer, I just rent a van a few times a year with the money I save and move my camping equipment that way. But when I tried ordering that Kona, it had three, it had six month delivery time and I needed the car by November. Uh, so that was a no-go. Volkswagen ID3, same dilemma. Price is right, range is right, the size of the car is right, but doesn't have a trailer hitch, doesn't have a tow hitch with towing capacity. You can only put a bike rack on there and really bad delivery time once again. So I ended up ordering the Tesla. I thought, yeah, maybe I will pay a bit more each month than I'm doing now, but at least it's a cool car. And then when I ordered and I got a quotation from my insurance company, tax, etc., PP, I found out that this is cheaper to run than my Volkswagen Touran 1.6 liter diesel, which was actually a really economical car. But this is about 200 to 600 euros a year cheaper to run. And in it surprised me in which way it achieved that. I actually don't save a lot on fuel because the 1.6 liter diesel all weather was very economical. And depending on where I charge this, if I charge this at home with power from my solar panels, or if I charge this with regular grid power, or if I charge this somewhere on the road on a supercharger or somewhere, um, I pay vastly different prices for electricity. So if I charge it only on solar, I save 600 euros a year. If I only charge it on grid during daytime, then I only save 200 euros a year. And 100 euros of that is in insurance. I would not have thought that this car is cheaper to insure than the Touran because the Touran had a weaker engine and was a cheaper car. But 
this is about 100 euros cheaper to insure for me than the Turon was. I have no idea how insurance companies make up the prices. It's all fantasy prices to me. I was comparing uh, insurance prices when I was uh, getting insurance. Well, this car I used like uh, I looked at the insurance that was linked from the Tesla website, advertised as special electric car Tesla insurance. That was like 1,200 euros a year or something. Then I looked at the cheapest insurance on a big website that was comparing over a dozen different insurance companies. And the cheapest in there was 720 something euros. And then I went back to the insurance company where I had insured the Turan and got a quote from them. And it was 600 something. The cheapest one of all that I compared, not in that online search engine, and 100 euros cheaper than the insurance for my Turan had been. That was my surprise. So, let's start to actually talk about the car. This is 2020 Tesla Model 3 standard range produced in Shanghai for the European market. And I thought, I think this arrangement only lasted uh, the second half of 2020. But if there's any difference in build quality compared to the cars coming from the US, I can't see it. This is pretty well put together. The only complaint I have so far is that the lid of the trunk is not lining up really well. The uh, backlights are not lining up really well. There's a two or three millimeter gap. But oh well, as long as it doesn't rain into my car, I actually don't care. And it's not that uh, that the Turan I had before was so much better, a famous German build quality, my R's. Uh, in, within the first year, I had to replace a sensor in the exhaust system. Um, I somehow managed to rip off the sun visor, the sunscreen, and even though that was clearly faulty installed. It's not like uh, I just took it and ripped it off out of sheer frustration. No, I just used it regularly like, like this and it came off and that was not covered by the guarantee. That was not covered by the warranty. So I had to replace that out of my own pocket. 110 euros for piece of plastic and fired fabric and there was also a, like a nice strap rubber strap a stretching a textile strap where you could secure stuff within the trunk so it wouldn't slide around broke that within the first year and to to repair that to replace that they would have to take out all of the trunk lining so uh, the labor costs to repair that alone would have been way more than that strap was worth. So much for famous German build quality. Maybe if, if I were to compare this to something like an Audi, a BMW, a uh, Mercedes-Benz, this wouldn't look as impressive as I think it does. But I'm comparing it to the last car I owned, to, uh, to a car that is similarly in running costs as this. And it compares well. Steering wheel feels good. This plastic material back here is soft. That foot here feels nice. 
you've got uh, this huge screen that does everything set nav that works uh, it got all of the driving assist features I could want it's got cruise control it's got autopilot I, I can play music from my phone it's got wireless phone charging it's got a lot of places to put stuff because there's no transmission tunnel in the middle I can put a lot of stuff in this middle console and by the way from a construction standpoint this screen is genius if you were to put all of the functions I have in this screen on separate buttons you would have to wire up all these separate buttons and that takes time that takes money during production this is probably much cheaper to produce than a conventional car dash where you've got a small screen but lots of buttons around it this car drives really well it's the the cheapest most economical of the model 3s the standard range and it still has a range of over 400 kilometers it has the worst acceleration of all the model 3s and it still goes faster than any car i've ever owned when you put the foot down it's like you enter warp drive you just go I'll show you uh, in a moment when the road opens up. Steering is really direct. The car has a lot of grip. This car can corner a lot faster than I would dare to corner. You have to keep in mind though, I, I'm comparing it to, to the cheap compact cars and to that very economical uh, family van the Turan I had before and of course this will handle better so let's talk about about electric cars in general for a moment about the most common arguments leveled against getting electric cars that I have heard uh, from associates, business associates, from uh, family and friends before. And one thing that comes up most often is that it takes so long to charge them. You can put fuel in, uh, in a regular car in five minutes and be on your way while an electric car you have to charge up for hours. I don't think that in most use cases this argument holds any water. As long as you're not on a very long road trip, you actually don't have to stop and refuel your car. If it's electric or if it's gasoline, doesn't matter on your regular daily driving you don't have to stop and refuel it and even if you have a long commute if you commute for an hour if you commute for 100 kilometers 200 kilometers commute which would be insane this has enough range to get you to work and back on the same day and you can recharge it overnight takes about a minute to plug it in and most likely your commute is not that crazy so you don't have to recharge it every night and even even on a long road trip it's not like I can drive a thousand kilometers without stopping to take a break I need a break to go to the toilet to drink a coffee to rest my eyes I take long road trips regularly and have made a habit of stopping every two hours so I'm not too fatigued to drive safely. And 
I can recharge this car during those breaks, go to a supercharging station and will load up from 0 to 80% battery in 20 minutes. So I really see that as a problem, not at all. And if you're not taking long road trips, you don't have to go to the gas station ever again, saving time and money. And you don't have to get your fingers dirty with a fuel pump. And it goes. Ah. You would also hear the argument that the battery degrades really quickly and the car will be broken within two years or something. And that argument comes from the perspective of some of most phone owners. Because um, batteries on smartphones usually degrade really fast, but that's different battery technology. The batteries in an electric car are made to last a really long time. You've got like a degradation of a few percent of range you lose each year. And maybe after 10 years you will be to just 50% of the original range but really if you're so worried about that uh, you can get the car on a lease instead of buying it and get a new one after three or four years to be sure you always got a good battery the newest technology and it's not like it's so different from an ice engine car ice engines have a lot of varying parts a lot of a lot of moving parts in the engines, they've got a huge thermal load each time they are used. You have to uh, put a lot of maintenance to keep that running. You've got to put on oil, new seals. You have to go to inspection once every year to make sure the engine's running properly. And even while doing all that, the engine will lose efficiency and at some point you will have to uh, replace some of those varying parts and that might be expensive. When I was giving my Turan back uh, at the dealership, they told me everything that is wrong with the car, wanting to make me pay for it. And then I was getting a quote to get all of that fixed and I've got like leaking, I've got like a leaking uh, valve cover gasket, valve cover seal and a leaking clutch seal. So both of that would have to be replaced to keep driving and also new disc for the brakes. And replacing all of that to make the car run again, I would have to pay 2,000 euros. And this electric car doesn't have a valve cover. You never have to change the oil. It has regenerative braking using the electric motors to put the battery, to put the energy back into the battery. So you won't be using your brakes much. You will save on both brake pads and brake discs. I probably won't have to replace either of this in the four years that I will have this car on lease. So I will save, hopefully save, a lot on maintenance on this car. And that is not yet factored in, in my calculation, that this car is cheaper to run.
So, about the bad past. It's not all, it's not all bees and roses. Even though this is very similar in running costs to my Turan, this is a way less practical car. The Turan was a, mini, a minivan, a hatchback, and this is like a regular sedan, so of course I can't seat seven people in here. I can't put as much cargo in here. It will have terrible range when I pull the trailer, probably 200 kilometers or something. Um, now that I've got this technically, this technical software driven car, I've got problems I only used to have with my computer and my phone. Namely, uh, like on, on the day I got this car, this screen froze up on me. And there are no buttons in here to restart this. There, there's no power button at all. If this screen freezes up, can't do anything. Uh, but then I researched on my phone that I could force a restart of the touch screen if I hold down both buttons of the steering wheel. And you could somehow restart the whole system if you push both buttons and the steering wheel and the brake, I think. So I worked that out with my technical expertise that is Google the problem and see if someone else has a solution for it. Works often. Also, because Tesla still thinks of this of like a uh, upper middle class car, something like a BMW, BMW 3 Series. They think it's supposed to be sporty. Uh, this has huge wide tires that are more expensive to get, that are not that fuel efficient. And uh, to get winter tires I had to get, I couldn't get winter tires, I couldn't get steel rims for this car. I think because the brakes are so huge I need to get aluminium rims. And I got the cheapest aluminium rims I could find. I, and hopefully I can keep them, use them for the next car or sell them. And I don't use them anymore. And I didn't want to order the original Tesla rims when I ordered the car with winter tires because I calculated that the 2,000 euros they charge for those wheels, I would pay through my monthly leasing fee, through the monthly weight, completely during those four years. And I wouldn't own those wheels. So instead I opted to buy some myself, get uh, cheaper rims, buy the tires myself, choose the tires myself. And I spent 1,100 euros on that, still a lot of money. But when I sell this car, I will try to sell the rims, try to sell the wheels or try to continue using them and try to save money that way. And it's still cheaper than it would have been getting those wheels through the Tesla. One thing you will hear people level about level against electric cars is that they're actually not good for the environment. I mean they're not like a boon to the environment, of course not. This is still a huge heavy luxury item you don't actually need. I don't actually need a car if I'm living near a European city. I can go everywhere through 
public transport, it's just a huge hassle to do it. Especially if you want to go LARPing. You can't go LARPing or camping on, on public transport. Maybe camping if you're a backpack camper or a bicycle camper with really light gear. But my LARPing tent is like 40 kilograms. I couldn't move that on public transport uh, in my armor at that with weapons. And that's without any sleeping equipment, any cooking equipment. But they will say that an electric car is actually less environmental friendly than an uh, ICE car because it takes so much energy and resources to make the battery. And then they run some numbers, but they really, they do bullshit calculations. They take the, uh, the energy it would have cost to make the batteries 10 years ago and battery manufacturing has come a long way since then. And they don't take the energy it takes to make gasoline into account, to get it out of the ground, to move it, to, to, to refine it, to move it to the petrol station. All of that takes energy as well. And they usually say that electricity comes from coal power anyway, it's all coal power. So this would be like indirectly burning fuel, burning fossil fuels. But even if that were true, even if electricity only came from coal and the electric grid would not be like 50% renewables, like it is in Germany right now, um, this would still be more efficient. Uh, gasoline engines mostly produce heat. They've got at best a 30% efficiency. This has more like a 90% efficiency in using the energy from the battery to get you moving. So it's three times as efficient as a gasoline car. Within Within the first year of owning this, if you're driving more than a few thousand kilometers each year, you will make up the, uh, the CO2 difference for the production of this vehicle compared to an ICE car. And just imagine if everyone were driving an electric vehicle in cities that have a lot of car traffic. There's no speed limit. Well, we have a 100 kph speed limit on German back roads in general, but that sign was that the 70 kph speed limit was lifted. Uh, we've got lots of cars in the city, it, it's loud and they stink, they pollute the air and electric cars are very quiet, they don't have any emissions. Imagine that for a moment, the city would be much quieter and the air you breathe would be much better. It would be like the air was during the hard corona lockdown when no one drove anywhere. Only all of the year and without the lockdown. I mean, even if you think that the whole climate change debate is bullshit, you can't argue with cleaner air, cleaner water. It's what you breathe, it's what you eat, it's what you drink.
at this point I'm just having a nice fun drive through the German countryside. I used to drive motorcycle, drive for fun. I only had cheap compact cars and family vans in the past, so those were not much fun to drive. Driving cars was never fun for me. Driving motorcycle was, but I drove my motorcycle so little that I sold it last year and from that money I bought Tesla stock. And that tripled in value until I sold it again to get sold on my roof. So um, financially that was a very solid decision. But I missed my motorcycle, I missed driving for fun. Now I'm driving for fun again. This car is fun to drive. This is maybe the first cool car I have ever owned. This is the first car I owned that I actually wanted to get. That is not some huge compromise. I mean, it's a compromise. What I actually wanted to get was the Model Y, Tesla Model Y, because it's got a hatchback, it's got a way bigger trunk. I could get all of my LARPing equipment in there. But in 2020, I couldn't get the Model Y in Germany. I will probably be able, I would be able to get it in 2021 if we're still looking for a car, when they start production in Germany. But oh well, I think I can live for four years with this car and then get the car I really want. The Cybertruck, made out of stainless steel, won't rust, won't dent. Do you know how much it costs to get scratches in the paint fixed? How much it costs to get dents in the bodywork of a car fixed? It's ridiculous. You could put a sledgehammer to a Cybertruck and it wouldn't dent. That's just crazy tough. That car I wouldn't lease. That car I would try to, uh, to buy. And that would be a really nice car to put all of my LARPing gear in the back and then still put my trailer on it. But they will probably have to make a European version for that. That Ford F-150 size that is so common in the US, that's way too large for European cities. We don't have roads or parking lots that are commonly that big. What uh, Americans would consider a small truck, like a Toyota Hilux or a Ford Ranger, would be a very big car on the European streets. So if I can get a cyber truck that is as big as a Ford Ranger, I would be all for it. I used to drive this route with my motorcycle. It's about a hundred kilometers, it's about an hour long, depending on how fast you drive. And it's nice to, to be able to drive this road again without having a really bad conscience because you're 
burning gasoline, polluting the environment, wasting money. I mean, I'm still wasting money, but not as much because this is a very economical car. Driving motorcycle is also dangerous. You don't think about that when driving. But it's very easy to, uh, to be overlooked on a motorcycle and someone crashes into you. Or to uh, just mess up while cornering, slip and fall. And there's no airbags, there's no crumple zone. When you fall on your motorcycle, you usually get hurt. And if you've got responsibility for other people, you should take care not putting yourself in unnecessary danger. So driving motorcycle uh, somehow didn't feel right anymore. But this car is really safe. I think this three safest cars in the world are all Tesla. Model S, Model X, Model 3. This has a huge crumple zone up front where normally the engine would sit. So an ICE car has no chance matching that crumple zone. There's just so much empty space up there. It's also got this glass roof, which during a side impact won't fold into itself. It will crack, it will shatter, but it will keep its structural integrity. So the car won't be pushed in the side and the, uh, the, the space where you're sitting in won't be compressed, keeping you safe. And of course, it, it's got airbags everywhere and it's got the newest safety features for driving assist, traction control, everything. It got cameras and radar systems. It can see cars in front of other cars you can't even see. It will break for you. Uh, it may even avoid crashes for you. There are some videos on YouTube where Teslas are avoiding crashes that you wouldn't have been able to see and avoid as a human. Really impressive. And because it's got all of the batteries in the floor, all of the weight in the floor, it's got a really low center of gravity. For one thing, that is good for handling. There's little to no body roll in this car when I go hard through the corners like this. This is a beautiful road. Look at these corners. This is the standard model, still the fastest car I ever owned and plenty fast on this back roads. I wouldn't dare to go any faster through here. Yeah, now we're really flying. So much grip on winter tires with a wet road. Also, because the center of gravity is really low, this car is unlikely to flip over during a crash. There's like a video of a Tesla Model X, the big SUV, 
where they try to flip it over during a test and like slammed it into a bed of sand and it flipped onto its side and then stood back up on its wheels that looked like it was defying physics and usually an SUV would have flipped over completely because uh, the center of gravity lies higher because of the engine that builds higher and the fuel that is usually a bit higher in the body of the car well maybe not the fuel but certainly an internal combustion engine builds much higher than electric motors and batteries In the news in the last few years you always saw articles, headlines that a Tesla somewhere burned down and I think yeah that's a theoretical possibility. If this battery pack is structurally impaired or has really bad failure it can catch on fire. But in a regular car you've got like 50 liters of gasoline in there highly flammable liquid um, that will fume that will easily vaporize when it's hot outside with uh, flaming hot exhaust yeah regular cars catch on fire all the time it just doesn't make the news it's normal Maybe I'll do two versions of this video. One short, just review version and one long, leisurely drive version. Set it to some classical music. Because this is, this is such a nice drive. Nice and relaxing stroll through the German countryside. Warp speed. And this car is just so easy to drive. Like this little lever on the right of the steering wheel, that's the gear selector. Uh, down is drive, up is reverse, neutral is in the middle. And because it's right there, it's all digital anyhow, when I'm, um, what do you call it? When I'm parking the car, something. Rangieren, we'd say in Germany. When I have uh, to change a lot between driving backwards and forwards, this is so much faster than a manual who wants, where I have to play with the clutch and the gear lever down here, or most other automatics that would have the gear selector down here. So totally unnecessary movement maybe they could do one better and put buttons in here like on a PlayStation but this works really well and it also serves uh, as a double function because when I'm driving it knows that I don't have to put the car in drive anymore 
so I can put it down and it will go into true and I can put it down and will go into cruise control and I could put it down twice and it will go into autopilot and steer for me let's see if I can go to the autobahn and show you A3 would be fine I don't think this road leads actually to the A3 before I get home. I have to cut the boring parts out of this video. I will certainly do a version of this that is just a very short review version. Five minutes, ten minutes tops, showing the strength of this car, making my points about electric cars. Don't want to scare everything, everyone off with a video that is one hour long review. <laughs> Tesla Model 3, GM's perspective, playtime one hour and six minutes. Seba driving live stream from the German Autobahn. Actually, if many people watch this video, I might make more of those. Maybe the channel gets so big that I can buy my electricity to make these drives. It's like live streaming video games, only it's not live and it's not a video game. This might become a driving channel. Let's try Seba Drives. That might be fun. Just me leisurely driving somewhere through the best roads I can find and talking about things I'm thinking about Really, this YouTube thing is uh, an effort to build somewhat of a community, somewhat of a following, because I actually want to become an author. Currently, writing a fantasy novel, I think you would call it the subgenre Sorted Planet. And if I get a lot of people from my YouTube channel that would be interested in buying and reading that book. That would be a huge advantage to get that writing career off the ground. I'm certain now I want hit the Autobahn. I know this road. I know where it leads. But yeah, build a community to get the book started, get the book off the ground. Hopefully the book will be so good on its own that people will love to read it and will want to read more of my books. They will be motivated to write more and I can quit my day job and focus solely on writing and gaming and YouTube. But first things first, get more people to follow me on YouTube, write a really good book, get the really good book published. No speed limit, warp speed.
This is now an autopilot. This is not the full self-driving. This is the regular one where I didn't have to pay a lot of money up front. It's adjusting to the speed limit. I, well, I don't know if it will take this corner. But it, it actually does. But it's kind of scary. <laughs> I trust the autopilot to drive me on the autobahn. But, but on this twisting back roads, no, no, I'd rather do that myself still. But this is a really cool function on the freeway, on the autobahn, in traffic, especially in traffic. When you're in a traffic jam, you can just put this on autopilot, sit back and relax, and will keep a safe distance from the guy in front of you, accelerate, brake, steer, do all of that. So you don't have to focus a lot on the road. Maybe put on a nice audio book and make that whole experience more bearable. Really, people are wasting way too much time in traffic and stuck in traffic. If you've got a daily commute, you will know what I'm talking about. If you've got a long daily commute during rush hour, you will know what I'm talking about. It's terrible. You're wasting so much resources. And even if the traffic stops, you wouldn't turn off the engine of your car because you still need like the aircon. Well, you will freeze in winter or it will get really stuffy and unbearably hot in summer. So you keep the engine running for the aircon. This car has all of that electric. So uh, when I'm standing around, I can turn on the aircon without the engine turning over, wasting a lot of energy. The newer versions of this car, 2021 model and Model Y, have a heat pump that is three times as efficient at heating and cooling the car than the regular system that is still in this car. But the one this car is not bad at all. And uh, if you never had an auxiliary heater in your car, that is just so comfortable, such a good extra to have in winter. You can uh, remotely turn it on 50 minutes before you have to leave for work and the windows will be ice free. You don't have to scratch any ice and the windows won't fog up when you're driving and breathing on them. So you don't have to wipe that away and that improves your visibility, you're not distracted, that improves safety. And if you were to sleep in your car, you could make it nice and warm with the auxiliary heater. And I had that as an extra in the true run, it was really nice. But it's standard in this. I can do that from, uh, from my phone, from the Tesla app. I can plan when I want to leave, uh, have that all automatic. And sure, heating the car up in winter before driving takes a lot of electricity and that will decrease the range significantly. But at home, to defrost your car, you can do that while you're still plugged in and it won't cost you any range.
I also got some fancy camera electronic features. It's got a dash cam feature. You can put an USB stick in the glove compartment and it will automatically record while you're driving. So if you happen to come into an accident, uh, you'll have proof that it was not your fault. And it actually saves that internally at least like 10 minutes of driving or so. And if you get into an accident, you can then put the USB in and get that video data. You can also set it to like um, only record when you push the horn. So push the horn when something's happening and then we'll record. But uh, I will get a USB stick, especially for this, put it in there, leave it in there all the time. And it's also got something called sentry mode. Uh, what that does, it, uh, it takes videos of people approaching your car. And if they do something to your car, break off a mirror, scratch the paint, throw a rock through your window, you'll have a video recording of that person from eight camera angles. Can give that to your insurance, can give that to your police, and hopefully the guy that did you wrong will be caught. But I think that will also be a deterrent for anyone to try something with your car. When sentry mode is enabled, there's like a huge red eye on the dash telling everyone, yes, sentry mode is enabled, you're under surveillance. I mean, Tesla plans to make the, these cars usable as a robo-taxi something straight off of a sci-fi movie uh, only a few years ago and they might do that next year and supposedly if i get the full self-driving package that is seven seven thousand five hundred euros i can make back that money make back the money for the entire car by using it as a taxi by letting itself drive around get people from A to B, they will pay me through the Tesla RoboTaxi app and I will make money that way and the car will become an investment good rather than a drain on my resources. I haven't gotten that yet because I think in the four years that I'm owning this car, I will maybe have two years where it will be possible to use it as a robo-taxi. More likely not even that, not because Tesla will not make it happen, but because European regulations will take a few years to adjust. You've got like full self-driving 2.0 beta in uh, the US right now. The car can basically drive itself everywhere. We don't have that in Europe. The legislation is lagging behind terribly. So I'm not putting my money into full self-driving right now, but maybe, maybe the next car. Maybe in four years' time, the legislation will be passed and I will be able to get a car I can then rent out as a robo-taxi. But that might also not happen, because at that point, for one, I could just use a robo-taxi whenever I use a car. I'm mostly doing home office these days and use the car few times a week for groceries or meet my friends and I might do that with a robo taxi or would have to run the numbers which would run me cheaper in the long run.
and also Tesla might stop selling cars to private customers, might stop selling cars at all and only offer them via robo-taxi service. That might happen. Not sure they will actually pull it off. There's no way for me to tell how big that market will be. Right now taxis or Uber for that example are expensive because they need a driver and he needs to make a decent hourly wage. Robo taxi you only need to make a bit of a prof bit of a profit over the actual running costs of the car. So maybe they can offer these rides for so cheap that it makes no sense to own a car if you're not driving around all of the time. Maybe everyone will stop owning cars and just uh, call a robo-taxi whenever they need to get anywhere. Maybe cars will only become a Maybe cars will become something you rent, something akin to public transport and only people, uh, real car enthusiasts, will still actually own cars so they can customize them. And that might only be really special cars, sports cars, classic cars. I think at one point we will need to have synthetic fuel to put into these classic cars that is environmental friendly fuel. That will probably not work. Um, there are many companies however that offer to rebuild a classic car with an electric drivetrain. And imagine what a drivetrain like from this Tesla Model 3 could do an all light car that is not packed full with heated seats, clever electronics, something that is really basic from the 60s or 70s, basic but really light. Something like an uh, old Porsche 911, something like a VW Beetle. With a drive train from a, a Model Three such as this, they would go crazy. They would be super fast, super quick. So I definitely see a market there. But if you're an Uber driver, if you're a taxi driver, if you think about becoming a driver of any kind, think again, that market will vanish within the next 10 years. Trucks, lorries will be automated, robo-driven, buses will be robo-driven, taxis will be robo-driven, the bots are coming for our jobs. You need to train in a job that can't be replaced by a robot. something that uh, is either creative or is so manually complicated that a robot can't replace it anytime soon. Something like an artist, an author, musician, though right now that's a hard way to make a living if you're not one of the 
one percent of the best musicians out there less than one percent one in thousand of them can make a living most it's just a hobby same with painting and most arts really but if you're like an artisan or if you're a craftsman a carpenter if you make furniture if you're a blacksmith if you make custom goods if you can refurbish old cars make them electric you are really handy if you can put uh, pipes in houses if you are a plumber or an electrician those won't be easily replaced with robots that's just too complicated and I think there will be a resurgence for really high quality custom made furniture clothing and such as like a counter movement to our cheap mass produced IKEA furniture people will want to have something special again something that will last you might work in a company producing such things you might start one you might do that independent you might also have a crafting YouTube channel yeah I've got one it's called LARP Ride I'm making LARPing equipment in there and I thought about going professional uh, sell custom-made LARPing equipment and at the same time make videos about it how I'm making it but I actually don't enjoy making LARPing equipment that much mostly because LARP weapons are plastic foam and glue pieces of toxic crap and I don't like making them that much I like leather working I like uh, sewing tailoring I like carpentry making boxes and furniture but making lab weapons no and I also don't think I'm that good that I could really uh, compare in the market compete that I could really compete in the market for custom-made lab equipment custom tailored clothes custom lab carpentry and stuff and make a decent living on it maybe I could get to that point but I think I've got strength elsewhere I go can make YouTube videos can make YouTube videos about crafting can make YouTube videos about gaming and can make YouTube videos about writing stories I can write stories and books but there certainly is the possibility to become a carpenter and you make nice wooden furniture uh, and maybe make them completely per hand use no power tools and at the same time make YouTube videos about it if you use no power tools these YouTube videos will become uh, will get something of a serene quality to them because uh, you won't make a lot of loud ugly machine noises so they have this like serene quality and people can watch that to relax I follow uh, two channels that are similar I mean what the men are doing in those channels is interesting to me one is primitive technology that's a guy in shorts somewhere 
in a tropical rainforest and he's building stuff without using modern technology. There's no voiceover, there's no music, just the sound of the forest and him working. And that is really nice to watch. The other, uh, I think the channel is called Mr. Chickadee. And uh, that is mostly carpentry. That's a man that really knows this carpentry. He's using like uh, Japanese and Korean woodworking techniques with uh, really complicated joinery and no nails used. And he doesn't use any power tools. Because of that, it's just really nice and relaxing to watch him work. At the same time, I wish I could work like that, so uh, somewhere in my basement I've got a really old hand drill and I think I should refurbish and use that for my carpentry instead of my power tools. And YouTube, Instagram, whatever, certainly a way people can make a living. I follow a few professional YouTubers who started out just at the beginning of this year or so. And they make more money from YouTube advertisement in a month than some people make in a year on a regular job. It's crazy. I'd be happy if this channel gets big enough to pay for itself and to give me a built-in audience for my books. If I can get this channel to 500,000 or maybe a million subscribers, that is probably not enough to live off. But together with uh, books I write, books I publish, the job I'm doing right now, maybe some sponsorship deals, maybe I do some some merchandise, some Led Seba merchandise. I should be able to make a decent living doing things that I like doing. Not commuting to work each morning for an hour, working seven hours in a boring desk job with colleagues that go on my nerve and a boss that doesn't know what I'm doing and doesn't value my work, then driving back home another hour, then it's probably dark. No, thank you. Rather work for myself, work on projects that fascinate me, that stimulate me intellectually, do work that I think is worthwhile doing and make a decent living out of it. Don't need to be super rich. I think there's a point at which more money doesn't bring you more happiness. I think for me that point would probably be reached with a yearly income of 50,000 euros. I can see that I can could make that work very comfortably. And sure, that's not a small income, not by any stretch of the imagination, but it's also not a super big income. Could easily make 50 thousand euros a year working full-time as an engineer and if you're a real workaholic 
a well-paid job you can make a hundred thousand euros or thumbs something a year but you only got one life and if you're using your life if you're wasting your life working for someone else someone you maybe don't even like just for money and once you go to a point where you're living safely and comfortable, all you can buy is more expensive toys. That doesn't really give you any more satisfaction, doesn't make your life any more worth living. I think there's a certain argument for minimalism self-reliance, self-sufficiency. Don't need to clutter up your life with useless material wealth. Focus more on the human experience. Meet people, go places, do stuff. Do crafting. Make something with your hands. Raise plants. Build a house. Plant a tree. Do something that will outlast you. Something of value you can give back to the world. Well, I'm back home. That is certainly the end of this video. If you're still watching, consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks and goodbye.